Good afternoon. This is David Eastwood, Geotech Engineering and Testing. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Vicky, can you hear me? What we are here to listen to is about geotechnical and, envi and environmental consideration of the design of renew renewable petrochemical, industrial, and port facility projects. Thank you for uh, sharing your afternoon with me. We have about 260 people RSVP'd. And uh, we have a lot of engineers, lots of engineers. We've got a few attorneys, a lot of structural engineers. So um, good cross section of the people. So everybody can hear me, that's good, good, good. If you need to reach me, uh, David Eastwood. My email is de at geotecheng.com, 713-699-4000. I'm with a company called Geotech Engineering and Testing. We're located in Houston. We've been in business for about 35 years and we do geotechnical environmental material testing and forensic evaluation. We have a staff of 60 engineers, geologists, and technicians, and we work all over Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. We have our own drill rigs. Let's see. If you have questions, please type in your questions in the Q&A on the bottom of your page, and I'll answer it. And sometimes I don't answer all the chats. And... Uh, facilities let's talk about some of the facilities as they relate to renewable energy in this case is the solar farms uh they're popping all around houston area and uh, in texas uh we just did a 5,000 acre track out there near cleveland texas for solar farms wind farms they're, they're all over the place too. Texas leading the country in terms of wind farms. You can see them, they can be onshore and offshore. All right. Let's see. We got some problem with the, this bar here. Various petrochemical facilities all over Texas. This is Port of Houston out there near the Houston Ship Channel. Uh, out there, out there East Houston, you see the tank farms, Port of Houston facility. This is Jacinta Port at Port of Houston. You got the ship, you got a major paving here with lots of load on it. Uh, you can see the terminal structure here. Again, this is another Port of Houston project. You can see the roller compacted concrete and uh, the cranes in here, power plants. Uh, basically, these are cell towers, cell sites, transmission towers petrochemical plants, and you see the cranes in here. These cranes can cause a lot of problems if you don't know what you're doing. So I'm gonna get into it in a minute. STP, South Texas Nuclear Power Plant. Uh, this is again, Port of Houston project, lots of load on the paving, a lot of cracked pavement. Pipelines, open excavation, horizontal, horizontal directional drilling augering pipelines type stuff. I got a few pictures of failure. It's a crane out there that got a bearing capacity failure and stuff like this can kill people. And you can see the crane failures. This is a uh, project here. There's a leak out there. There's a river here. Of course, they're bracing the excavation in here. There's a leak right there. That's Dubai. And of course, they didn't fix the leak and the whole thing starts collapsing. 
guy still in there with his crane. Here's another project in the coastal area of Texas. Uh, you got the, the port facility in here. These guys come over here, bring a ship. They want to deliver a bunch of gravel. As they do that, they load up the, the, uh, the, the port here in the terminal and uh, the whole thing starts failing. Major litigation, everybody was invited. So these are some of the industrial failures. Here's another crane out there on the construction site. You can see they've got two yards of concrete. That's about 7,000 pounds. And the crane fails, the outrigger sinks into the soil. It falls, cuts somebody's leg off. And you can see the outrigger in the sand. Here's a sinkhole in Liberty County near Houston. We have a lot of salt domes around Houston. Water gets into those salt domes and basically solves the salt into the water, create voids. As it does that, you get basically sinkholes. Sinkhole is a natural occurrence caused by groundwater leaking into the salt dome, dissolving part of it and causing it to collapse. Here's another sinkhole in Florida. This is a limestone sinkhole, but it creates by rainwater, essentially acidic water that just dissolves the limestone. And this is a storm sewer leak. This just eats up the hole, creates voids and pavement collapses. Here's another project in Louisiana. You see these tanks out here. These are about 220 foot in diameter. And well, I don't know, about 120 feet tall, if I remember. And the uh, contact loads is like 7,000 pounds per square foot, 7,000 PSF. And they were filled up with iron ore. And the whole thing collapses, bearing capacity failure. You can see the stack of iron ore in here. And uh, this is the iron ore at a bearing capacity failure. You can see this side's bulged up in here. There's a building out there uh, in China, fell down and it's sitting on piles. So what happened was they put the building on piles, they do an excavation in front of it, put it in the back, surcharge it, it comes here and you get a stability problem, global stability cuts the piles and starts falling. This is out there near Buffalo Bayou in Houston, slope failure near Buffalo Bayou. This is San Antonio, retaining wall, failing, causing these houses got problems. I guess this is important for you to know, it's so important that the proper design and construction of facilities uh, so that you don't have these type of failures. Uh, 250 homeowners have to be moved out because of the wall failure. If, if the wall was not engineered. Uh, here's another project out there on Lake Condro. You see all the cracks in here, the retaining wall failure. The excavated in front of the wall in here, try to create a channel to connect to this channel. And as it did that, this wall failed. As this wall failed, the whole backyard failed. The backyard of these houses, the pools start moving. Flat work starts cracking. Here's another slope failure case. It's a golf course out there on San Felipe. Beautiful place. And the near Buffalo Bayou in here, they went out there to try to stabilize these uh, uh, slopes. And they had a global stability failure. And you can see the whole slope failing. It's a green option. As soon as they did that, the slope started failing. And uh, there's a bunch of lawyers here, cannot play golf past this red line. And you can see the slope failing right there. 
So if you do a development, any kind of a development, industrial, petrochemical, or commercial, residential, one of the first thing you will do is a phase one environmental site assessment based on ASTM 1527-21. So you go ahead and develop this area here. If you got these tank farms over here, these tanks can cause contamination that's gonna uh, contaminate the soils in here. Even if they contaminated your site, you're responsible for the cleanup costs. Here's, uh, if you wanna develop this area here, again, this petrochemical plant can cause contamination. You're responsible for cleanup. Again, you can see the tank farm in here. Yeah, petrochemical, these guys can cause contamination. These gas stations, they can cause groundwater contamination because of the underground storage tanks. These underground storage tanks, some of them are old, been there for a long time. They leak, and if they leak into the soil and groundwater system, you are responsible for the cleanup cost. Uh, here's the contaminated soil. Some of these drums can be causing contamination on the site. This is an oil well. These are the oil wells near Kingwood. This is your site and all these oil wells and anywhere where there's oil well, there's oil pit. And these guys can cause contamination. Here's another site that's got an oil well right there. Landfills. These landfills are sanitary or industrial. They got lots of waste. And these waste, when it rains, leachates into the soil and groundwater system and can cause contamination. Pipelines, these pipelines, if they rupture, they can cause contamination. So it causes lots of contamination on the site. These are pipelines going on the site. We're doing a phase one on this plant project. There's a lots of contamination out here. So we had to do a phase two environmental site assessment with the pipeline alignment. Cleaners can cause contamination. You have underground storage tanks. And these underground storage tanks, they got carcinogens that can basically drain into the soil and groundwater system. As they do that, they contaminate the whole area. So you gotta watch out for cleaners. Cemeteries, you cannot build on it, more. you cannot go through them. If you go out there in the Heights area, you got all these brownfields areas, old buildings. You got to tear them down, build new stuff. And as you do that, you're going to worry, worry about asbestos and lead based paint. So you got to worry about that as kind of if the structure was built before 1980 or so. As part of the phase one, you look at the aerial photos. If this was the site in 1938, you can see as 1944 development starts coming in. This is 1989, and you can see the chemical plants in here coming in, body shop, car wash, dry cleaners, service station, loop center, and service station. All these things can cause contamination along the alignment of this project. This is a track out there in Heights, 1925, there was just a house there. 1969, there was a service station there. This service station contaminated all these areas here. So they want to tear up all these houses and build condos. So they have to go out and take out a lot of the contaminated soils and bring in clean soils. So this, this is your site. We go about one mile around the whole site. You get these red dots. These are all the things uh, that can cause contamination to your site. And you get a table that looks like this, and these various facilities can cause contamination in your site. For example, on this site here, you got 14 leaky underground storage tanks. One of them within one eighth of a mile, mile, one within one eighth to one fourth of a mile, 10 of them one and a half to one mile. Underground storage tanks, there's 12 of them near your site. So it's a phase one environmental site assessment. You do a site reconnaissance, Regulatory agency review, historical site visits, you go do interviews, you talk to the property owners, 
do property title search. If there are buildings on your site, you check for asbestos, lead-based paint. If you're doing an industrial site where you got oil tanks and stuff like that, you got to do a phase two environmental site assessment. And uh, in accordance to ASTM E1903, because if you go out there and start digging out, you're going to see tanks and, and free product, uh, oil out there in the ground. You see that a lot of east of Houston where you got soil contamination. So you got to watch out for these things, surface water, groundwater contamination, soil contamination, uh, damage to the wildlife. It's a wellhead in the middle of the forest. There was no record of it th through TCEQ. So we had to do a bunch of borings around it to make sure it was not contaminated. As part of the phase one environmental site assessments, you go back to the files of the TCEQ, EPA, Texas Railroad Commission, and to see if there are any kind of historical information regarding contamination. Field exploration. A lot of times if you got contaminated sites uh, as part of the phase two environmental, you do geoprobe investigation. This is like an inch and a half pipe, diameter two inches or so. You hydraulically push it into the soil. That's what the soil, that's what the sampler is, hydraulically. And then it's got sleeve inside of this. You open it up, you pull the sleeve in there, it's got a soil sample in there. You cut the sleeve. That's what the soil sample looks like. Good thing about this thing is it does not have any cuttings. There's no cross contamination. You take the samples, you put them in a jar, you put them in ice. You clean up the equipment so that uh, there's no cross contamination, and then you go back with sampling. If you want to get groundwater sample, you put a PVC pipe in the hole, and like a one-inch PVC pipe, you can pump the water out, or you can use a baler. You use a, just a geo pump there. You can pump the water out and get a water sample. These are the soil samples that looks like coming out. You put them in a jar. As you're doing this, you do OVA, organic vapor analyzer, or PID, which is a photoionized detector, to show high levels of uh, carbon in, and uh, in your samples. If you got high 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 levels of carbon in it, and uh, then you can take those samples and do testing on them. So is what the PID does and OVA does. It basically picks up high levels of hydrocarbon in, in, your, uh, in your samples. And then you test those soils. So you do chemical testing on these soils if they're contaminated. You do typically TPH, total petroleum hydrocarbon, BTEX, benzene, tiling, xylene, and ethyl benzene, volatile organic compounds, MTBE, PCB, heavy metals, herbicide, pesticides. These are typical tests we run on petrochemical industrial facilities to see if there are contamination. You take the samples to a chemical lab, you put them in a the machine, and you do these tests. If your site is contaminated, you dig out the contaminated soils. That's one of the ways you do it. There are other ways you can do it too. Uh, you dig it out, stockpile and put plastic on top of it. So when, you, when it rains, water is not going to shed into the excavation into the soils. Then you put them in a specialized containers. You take them to a chemical dump. Backfill it with a structural fill. And lift, eight inch lifts all the way to the top. The other thing you have to worry about is wetlands. Some of these developments, you got to worry about wetlands. Wetlands areas that are inundated by, saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency sufficient to support and under normal circumstances to support 
prevalence of vegetation typically adopted for saturated soil conditions. Wetlands are, are swamps, marshes, bogs, in similar areas. And they're basically regulated by the US Corps of Engineers. These are some pictures of the wetlands environment. You see the type of vegetation grows in a wetland environment. Water comes up all the way to here. We have a lot of wetlands in Harris County, Galveston County, Montgomery County, Brazoria County. All these coastal areas, they got lots of basically wetlands. This is Leak City. You got a bunch of houses here, but this is wetland here. So we're not developing this area. This is Galveston County. You go out there towards 45, going near Galveston. You see all the wetlands here. Here's a map of efficient wild, um, map of the wetlands out there on the project site. All the green areas are the wetlands. These are fish and wildlife uh, maps from National Wetland Inventory. These are typical vegetation that grows in a wetland environment. See the wetland in here, water comes all the way up to here. Why do I know if I have jurisdictional waters? Jurisdictional delineation are performed on a property in order to delineate which waters are the waters of the US and are therefore subject to Clean Water Act 404. Most often you just fill out the jurisdictional delineation form, we use the US Corps of Engineers and the Corps just verifies and you can just go build based on that. Wetland delineation are conducted in accordance to 1987 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual. Okay, so what makes a wetland? In order to have a wetland, you got to have that water. You have to have hydric soils. These are smelly black soils. Soils underwater for a long time. You have to have certain plants that grow in a wetland environment. You should have all these three components of hydric soils, water loving vegetation, wetland hydrology for you to have a wetland. Subsidence. Parts of Houston is subsiding, the whole Houston area. Subsidence is the lowering of the elevation of the land over time. Subsidence can cause a wide range of consequences depending on the location of the occurrence and its approx proximity to the surface drainage and coastal area. In this area, clay compaction resulting from groundwater withdrawal is the primary cause of subsidence. So as you take the water, all of these aquifers that are in Houston area, this is Houston, this is Galveston, these big bodies of sand, like Chico or Jasper, and these are all full of sand and water. You drill holes in these aquifers, you go start deeper to 7,000 feet, like Frio, this is Humble, Texas, these bodies of sand, that are laid out between Humble and Galveston, you tap into them and you take the water out. As you do that, the ground starts subsiding. As it does subsides, the area starts flooding. This is Goose Creek oil field. Used to be above ground, now it's underwater. So here are the areas that flood as a result of subsidence. This is a wellhead in Baytown. When they put it in, that was the elevation. With time and subsidence, the area dropped. This is Kingwood experiencing subsidence and flooding. This is Brownwood in Baytown, 1944. They had roads in it, the houses and stuff like that. This is 1953, 1978, 1989, 2002, 2012. So the area is slowly disappearing and, and floods. This is Houston Galveston area between 1906 and 1987, dropped as much as nine feet. These are values in feet. And here's the recent stuff from University of Houston that shows subsidence in Montgomery County, roughly about uh, 16 millimeters, which is about 1.6 centimeters which is roughly about half an inch a year, Montgomery County is dropping. So as they pull the water out of the Montgomery County and Fort Wayne County and Harris County, the whole area is subsiding. 
This is predicted subsidence between 1995 and 2030. And you can see parts of Houston drops from just five feet. Hopefully it's not gonna happen because we're going to a surface water system by North Harris County Water Authority, West Houston Water Authority, North Fort Bend Water Authority, San Jacinto Water Authority and others. As you go to a surface water, you don't have to go to groundwater to take the water out. So you're not gonna have as much subsidence. This is attic's area dropping at us about half an inch a year. Pasadena, stabilized, not dropping anymore. They're using surface water, faulting. So if you got parts of the area that are subsiding as a result of groundwater removal, and some areas that are not, there are cracks that have been in the ground for a long time. These cracks become activated, they show as faults. There are about 300 faults in the Houston Beaumont area from Corpus Christi to Beaumont. And they move roughly about half an inch a year. They show up underneath the buildings, about 200 feet deep here. Sometimes you don't see this is Ellington exit on I-45. You see the bump in here. This is the post oak fault out there. The house fault going through this. See the fault there. Here's a fault going through this house here. This is a, what we call, um, this is what we call the lineation and shear zone. This is the lower area. This is the upper area of the faults and this is the shear zone. And if you build anything in the shear zone of the upthrown section and downthrown section, it's the upthrown and downthrown, you're gonna have uh, cracking. This is, uh, this is the woodlands area, shows a fault going out there towards this house. Railroad structure going through a fault. You can see the deformation here. Upthrown section, downthrown section of the fault. You see the fault going right there, cracking the parking area, going toward the structure in here. So we got the upthrown section of the fault. This is the downthrown. This is the area that's dropping. It's the fault scarp right there. These are soil layers. So when it drops, the layer gets cut off, and, and this layer comes over here. This layer comes over here. This layer comes over here. And so you can go out there and do resistivity and spontaneous potential geophysical testing and find out where this, this basically fault scarp, scarp is. You can also look at a bunch of aerial photos. You see the lineation in here. This is downthrown section of the fault. This is the upthrown section of the fault. The downthrown is darker on aerial photo because there's more moisture and water gathers over there. Downthrown section, upthrown section, here's the lineation. If the side is wooded, you cannot tell from aerial photo. Or you got tall grass, you can't tell from aerial photo. So in this case, you would use LIDAR that uses laser light to measure distance. Use LIDAR, it shows deformation. Gets elevations using airplane, you send out LIDAR and you get the elevation difference and you can see where the fault is. Here's the property here and here's the fault going right through it. Here are fault maps, which if you go to our website, you can see some of these fault maps out there on our website, that's www.geotecheng.com. And you can see the faults all over Houston. These tickers here is the downthrown section, this is the upthrown section of the fault. And you see various fault maps that shows Texas, the whole area where you got faults. Most of the faults that are active in the Gulf Coast area. They're all faults in Austin and Dallas, but they're not active. And you can see LIDAR maps in here, LIDAR map of the faulting in the Houston area. Here's a project in Pearland and Macaulay Salt Dome area. These dark areas are salt domes around Houston. There are a bunch of faults near salt domes. Here's the site. You see all these faults? They're all going towards the site. There's a pipeline here. 
the green stuff. This is the property. It was a fault going through it. So we turned that into the hazard zone. It's about 130 foot wide. The downthrown section is twice as much as the upthrown section. So if it's 130 foot wide, the upthrown section is 35 foot wide. Downthrown section is about 70, 80 foot wide. And you can't build anything in here. You can turn it into the linear detention pond. You can turn it into a park, jogging track, whatever, but you can't build houses here. You can build here, you can build here, not where the fault is crossing. This is a school out there in Pearland Parkway near a fault. And we told them not to build a school because we're real next to a fault. They put it on deep piers and put beams underneath the, the slab with anchor bolts to adjust it every once in a while. You go there every couple of years, just adjust the slab. Field exploration, ground penetrating radar. Somebody asking a question, why the hazard zone on the downthrown section is twice as much an upthrown site? Uh, the reason the hazard zone is bigger on the downthrown sucks is more movement on the side downsize. So since there's more movement, we put more risks in there. So therefore, it's wider. Ground penetrating radar. Okay, if you want to know your site, you got, first of all, ground penetrating radar uses antenna that transforms electromagnetic energy similar to what cell phones use to transmit, transmit calls. A receiver is located within the antenna, receives the reflected signal when encounter, encounters it, when it hits materials with two different properties, dielectric values. So it sends a signal, it hits something, and it comes back up, and you, know, you can tell what kind of a distance you got from that. This is a Houston airport system. You want to know where the utilities are, so you run GPR on it, and you pick up the pipes that are located underneath. You can also find out utilities by water lancing. You get this basically these big trucks out there. They go either by air or water. They got high facility, you know, high pressure water or air that they can dig holes with and see if there is any kind of a utilities on the ground. They usually go four or five feet deep. Drilling and sampling. So if you got a plant like this, this is Exxon plant out there, Baytown. You send out drill rigs out there. These are the rigs. This is a big rig out there. It goes about 150 feet deep. This rig goes 120 feet deep. These are portable rigs, go 25, 25 foot deep. These are the, the smaller rigs about to go 30 feet deep. These are some ATVs. You get a plan of boring, where your borings are near your facilities, the pipe racks, where your facilities are, you get the plan of borings. Usually the civil firm gives it to you. Or I prefer to come up with the boring locations myself. Go out there and start drilling. This is a rig on a crawler. And it's drilling a boring. This is our truck mounted rig right there. And here's another rig out there in the Port of Houston. If the ground is soft, you put matting in the place. As you put matting, you can do, the rig can travel on it and do borings. If your site is wet, you can use what's called buggy rig. These guys got big tires and uh, big tires can go out there and, and go through mud, cost more money. He's a strong buggy rig right there. That's that golf course. You got buggy rig out there doing borings. Uh, before you do borings, a lot of times these sites, they got concrete on them. 
you pour the existing concrete, and then you go out there and do borings. Some areas you got these detention ponds that are contaminated. So you use airboats and you go drilling out there off the airboat in these ponds. Or you use basically barges. You put a rig on top of the barge. That's a barge out the Houston Ship Channel. You put a rig out there with a moon pool. You start drilling and get soil samples with your sheet pile walls, piling, pier structures. You can see the pipe. In areas that are heavily wooded, you may have to do a clear path or rig go through the woods. Here's the University of Houston project. See a portable rig out there in the water plant area. You couldn't get a rig out there, so use a portable rig. Use an airport system. You don't want a big rig out there in Hobby Airport, so we'll use a portable rig. This is a plant out there, water water tank that failed. Use a portable. It's a rig with lift it up with a crane. We we'll put it inside the tank and do borings with it. This is a tank structure. The bottom is failing. So you go through this hole here with a portable rig inside of it. This is inside the tank and do borings. Do borings inside the tank. We do most of the boring next to the biggest trees on the site. The trees tell us how deep your foundation is supposed to go. Here's a way to drop the hammer, get the samples. Most of the samples are with the Shelby tubes out there. These are three inch diameter tubes. They're hollow, about three inches in diameter. You get a soil sample and you extrude it. That's what the soil sample looks like. You look for root fibers. Root fibers extend to areas where there's oxygen and water. So, That tells us the depth of active zone. That's a zone that soils experience shrink swell problems. As you get duper, deeper, the uh, root fibers become smaller. This is a 140 pound hammer, drop 30 inches. You cannot get a samples of the sand with Shelby tube, with this type of tube. So you drive it into the sand because sand is dense. It's called standard penetration test. Get 140 pounds. Drop it 30 inches and drive it into the ground 18 inches, six inch, six inch, and six inch. The test, the standard penetration test, 140 pound hammer drop 30 inches, ASTM 1586. That's a split spoon sampler that you split it open. That's what the sample of sand looks like. If your blow counts is zero to four, your sands are loose, are very loose. Then five and 10 is loose, medium dense 11 to 30, dense 31 to 50, very dense over 50. You start going deeper, you're gonna hit rock. Rock is in Houston, is about 5,000 feet, 2,500 feet. And here's the project in Austin where you hit rock. You get the rock and you put it in a box like that. If you go out there on 105 out there near Conroe, on the west side of Conroe, you hit some sandstone. And if you go out there to on Alaska near Lake Houston, uh, Lake Livingston, you're going to hit some, uh, you know, sandstone out there as well. Of course, if you go to uh, other parts north of I-45 past Willis, there are some rocky soils out there. You take the soil sample, you cut the ends of it, you put it on foil, you put a job number on it and boring number and depth. Take it to the lab, you put it in a wax box so that it doesn't lose moisture. You wanna test the soils within you know, a couple of weeks of sampling, otherwise they start going bad. Cone penetration testing. 
on a lot of projects, industrial, petrochemical, also Harris County flood control, you got to use cone penetrometer testing. The new Harris County flood control recommends cone penetrometer testing. That's a CPT or 1.4 inch in diameter tube in here with the tip. That's what it looks like. You hydraulically push it into the soil. This is basically how you use the weight of the rig. You jack against it and push it into the soil. And see like that, you jack it against the rig. That's a CPT right there. That's a crawler in here. You got CPT in it. That's the device. That's a CPT. This is the inside where you got these pipes. You connect them to each other and hydraulically push them to the ground. So you jack up the truck, use it as a weight, reaction weight. You push it in, you got the tip and you got the sleeve. These are usually 1.4 in diameter uh, cones. You can push them down to about 120 feet, maybe deeper if your soft soils are present. Here's the tip. Here's the sleeve. Here's the tip. Sleeve right there. You get a bunch of wiggly lines. That's the friction of the, uh, the, the sleeve. Tip resistance of the tip. Conductivity, pore pressure, and you get the soil layers. Be clay and seams. You can pick up a small seams. And as you do this, you got the sleeve, you got the tip, pore water pressure, friction ratio, soil layering, clay, sand. You got the soil shear strength based on correlations. V angle in the sand and SPT values. So a very good device and it's a good information to use when you do soil, regular soil borings, do CPT to get more detailed information on the soil stratigraphy. So when we do CPT cone penetrometer testing, you get Continuous stratigraphy identifies thin seams and layers, estimates geotechnical and hydrological properties, faster in the field data, Interp interpolation, no cuttings. Piezometers. If you want to know where the groundwater is on your site, you get a piezometer. It's a PVC pipe, about two inch, three inches in diameter, maybe one inch. It's got perforated sides, and uh, you, you push it into the soil. You drill a hole first, about three, four inches, six inches in diameter. If it's a four inch PVC, three inch PVC, you drill a five inch, six inch hole, and then you push it in there, in the hole. After you drill it, you got the perforated area. The water will flow through it. You put sand around it. That allows the water to flow through it, it's permeable. Then above that sand, you use a uh, bentonite paddle, uh, chips out there, or bentonite pallets. These are bentonite chips, pebbles. And of course, you put a cap on it so that surface water does not penetrate it. That's a piezometer there. Then you go, this is sticking out of the ground, or it could be flush with the ground like this. This is flush with the ground. This is sticking out. You can put a tape measure to measure the depth of the water. This is the PVC pipe that's perforated. You know, bentonite pellets. Then above, above the bentonite, you put grout it so that the surface water does not come in. This is the riser sticking out of the ground. You measure the water table with the tape measure with the weight on the end of it. You throw it in there, you measure the water. Again, you can see how you measure the water here. 
you put a weight with a with it on and the end of the tape and you throw it in there. Number of borings for your pipe racks, you do one boring every 250 feet spacing. For stacks or towers, you at least do one boring underneath the towers. These these borings can be 50 foot deep, 60 foot deep. For pipe racks, you go at least 25 to go at least 30 foot deep. Bridges. You know, depending on uh, the kind of loading you got on the bridge, you can go about 100 feet deep or so. If your channel is two, two, 20 feet, you go 80 foot below that. So for roads, you got these 10 foot deep at 500 foot spacing. The bridges, you put borings every 300 foot spacing. This is your stream. Put a boring here, you put a boring there. If you got a long bridge, you put one here, 300 foot here, 300 foot here, here, you stagger them. So that's how you do it. With ditches and stuff like that, you do one boring every 500 feet, twice the depth of the ditch. Detention pond, you do five borings for the first five acres and do one boring for any additional five acres. Twice the height of the detention pond. Bulkheads, we do one boring every 250 foot spacing. Retaining wall, we do one every 250. Bulkhead is depth is at least twice the height of the unsupported length of the cantilever part of the bulkhead. So if your bulkhead is 20 foot high, you do 40 foot borings. Retaining walls, the same 250 feet spacing, somewhere about, you know, 30, 40 foot, depending on the top of retaining walls. If they're heavy, like MSC walls, you do borings 40 foot, 50 foot deep. Storage tanks. You usually do one boring in the middle and go around the perimeter at 100 foot spacing, you do 30 foot borings. These borings are usually equal to the diameter. So if your tank's 100 foot diameter, you do 100 foot boring in the middle, 30 foot borings around the perimeter. Piers, again, depending on the piling and all that stuff, you may have to do 100 foot borings out there. Parking lots, you do 10 foot borings. You know, one boring every 10,000 square foot. Buildings, depending how big they are, you may have to do one boring every 3,000 square foot or every, you know, if you're a tilt wall building, it's a million square foot building. Then you do one boring every, you know, 20,000 square foot or so. But it just depends how big your building is. Some of the things uh, you do in the field, you know, some of these petrochemical projects, you want to do resistivity tests. Uh, to see if there's any corrosion potential. This is what we call resistivity testing, where you put actually four probes in the ground and run current through it. This is the machine there, box. You put the probes in the ground. You measure the current going through it. You calculate the resistivity. You get a diagram that says where the sands are, where the clay is, where the water is, what the resistivity is. You can do laboratory resistivity testing. You put a sample in a mold like this. You connect it to electricity, run current through it. It's not very accurate. If your resistivity is less than 500 ohm second centimeter, uh, it's very se severe seal corrosion. 500 to 1,000, you got severe, 1,000 to 2,000, severe to moderately corrodibility. Years of penetrating the steel is, you know, 10 to 15 years. 10,000 to a million, you got slight. So now sulfate too, you have to worry about sulfate with your concrete. We got various types of concrete type. You got, uh, you got type one concrete, which is the typical concrete we use. Type 1A, normal air entrained concrete. Type two, moderate sulfate resistance. Type 2A, moderate sulfate resistant air entrained. Type three, high early strength. 3A, high early strength air entrained. Four, no heat of hydration. And five, high sulfate resistance. So when you check your soils and water, if you got sulfuric 
sulfates in the soil by weight of zero to 0 0.1, you got negligible, 0.1 to 0.2, moderate, severe between 0.2 to 2.0, very severe over 2.0 in soils. In groundwater, if you have zero to 150 is negligible, but if you go over 10,000 parts per million, uh, you gotta use type five concrete. So here, you know, like negligible, negligible, use a type one or type two concrete. On a lot of these uh, projects where you have uh, like renewable energy type projects, uh, where you have cables, uh, you want to know what the thermal resistivity of your soil is. The purpose of thermal resistivity is to evaluate the dissipation from the cables powering the renewable energy facility. Some soils work as insulators, which means that they hold the heat. Eventually, they heat up the wires and make them melt. Some of them, soils would dissipate the heat. They work as a heat sink. The purpose of thermal resistivity is to figure out what properties these soils have as, as it relates to thermal properties. Do they work as a heat, heat sink or as an insulator? Here's a device. You stick a probe into the soil. You can read this stuff here. You can see the probe right there. You can read. So you measure the thermal resistivity in the field. You can do them in the lab. You develop a report like this that shows moisture contents versus thermal conductivity, moisture uh, volumetric water content, thermal resistivity and moisture content versus compaction. So this is very important. Those guys who are doing all these solar farms, they all wanna know what the thermal resistivity is. So make sure you get that on as part of your investigation. Waves. When you do plant work, these petrochemical projects, they got lots of vibratory machines and these compressors as they, you know, vibrate, they, they have to design them for soil properties. Some of the waves that we get into is the P waves, S waves, rally waves, and love waves. So basically a P wave is a compression longitudinal wave. It involves successive compression and refraction of the material that goes, they travel. It, it travels parallel to the direction of the P wave. So if this is a T zero, that's the zero time, this is T1, first period, T2, second period, T3. And motions are all horizontal. It's called P wave. The stiffer the soil is, the faster it travels. Next one is S wave, shear wave. Basically, it's a seismic body that, that shakes the back, ground back and forth perpendicular to the direction of its moving. Okay, it's three dimensional. So it's got sideways as much as, as well as up and down. The motion is uh, individual particle is distributed by a S wave is perpendicular direction of the travel. And it says if the ground is, the, the stiffer the ground is, the faster it travels. This is T equal to zero period zero, T1, T2, T3. It goes up and down and sideways. That's a shear wave. Now, rally wave is a combination of the P wave and S wave and vertical components of the S wave with the earth that involve vertical and horizontal particle motion. Rally wave rolls along the ground just like, like a wave rolls across a lake, just like the ocean. It's like when you have earthquake, you get the rally wave first, but you get a rally wave coming in because it rolls, moves the ground up and down and side to side the same direction the wave is moving. Most of the shaking fell from an earthquake due to rally waves, which is much larger than the other waves. It's the rally wave, it just goes like that. T1, T2, T3. Love wave is basically the horizontal component of S wave. Essentially it goes side to side. T1, T2, T3. Field cross test. If you got vibratory equipment, 
you want to know what the shear margins of that soil is for your dynamic analysis. So you got the hammer in here and two geophones out here and the holes in here. You're all connecting to recording equipment. You drill the hole six inches in diameter. You put your hammer in the six inch and then you put six inch hole here, six inch hole here, two layers and run shear waves on it. Basically you put a hammer and you measure the shear wave and going through it. So this is the hammer. And you go, basically what you do is you, 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 you bang on the rod in here or the hammer. You have this distant H and here's the geophone in here. You know the distance, you measure the time that from the first signal to when you receive it in your geophone. Uh, so when you know that, you can calculate the velocity H over T sub S. That's the time it takes from the signal goes from here to here. That's the shear wave velocity. And shear modulus is rho times shear velocity times two, which is gamma over G H two T, T squared to S. You need the shear wave velocity out there when you do dynamic analysis on petrochemical projects. You can also measure that in the laboratory by a resonant column test. It's a column of soils that's basically extracted longitudinally and excited or torsionally and in one of its normal uh, modes of wave and velocity is determined. So you put a resonant column test, this is you put it in a device like this and you vibrate it, either up and down or torsional. You put it in a device like this and you do that, this is your soil sample. You put it in a plastic rubber membrane and you excite it out here. And from that, you can calculate the shear modulus. Shear modulus for soft clay is about 3,000 to 5,000 PSI. Stiff clay is 10,000 to 20,000. Hard clays are above 20,000. Medium dense sand, 5,000 to 15,000. Dense sand, 10,000 to 20,000. Gravel is 20 to 40,000 PSI. Most vibratory machine function at amplitudes and movements of shear strain in the order of 10 to the minus three. And there's a correlation between the soil shear strength, undrained soil shear strength, and shear modulus, usually about 1,500 shear modulus. So, so if you, this is roughly about 1,500 or, you know, 1,800 times shear modulus. So you multiply the shear strength by 1,500, right, you know, 1,800, and you get the soil shear modulus. You know, another thing you need for your dynamic analysis is Poisson ratio. It's the ratio of lateral to the direct strain for fat clays and saturated clays is about 0 0.4 to 0.5. For partially saturated clays, 0 0.3 to 0.45. For dense gravel, it's 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, 0 0.4 to 0.5. And uh, for medium dense gravel, uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. Damping ratio. We have two types of damping ratio when you have a machine foundation. You have a geometric damping and you got materials damping. Damping in soil foundation system consists of geometric components, which measures the energy radiated away from the immediate regions of the foundation. And material damping, which is within the soil itself that measures energy loss as a result of hysteresis effect. This is material damping over a shear strain of about 10 to a minus three with saturated clays and sand. It's usually pretty small. And, and here's basically geometric damping depending on the, sh of course, shape of your foundation. For example, if you're using a spread footing foundation, your damping is greater than if you use pile foundations or drill footings. So use what's called mass ratio, which is a formula. And based on that, depending on mode of your vibration, rocking, torsion, sliding, or vertical, 
you can get the damping ratio. Laboratory testing. Uh, you take the salt samples, you want to know how much water you should to it, add to it for it to behave liquid. And so you take a salt sample, you add water to it in, the, in a cup like this, and you mix it all up. When it comes water, you put it in here, you kind of go grow, groove through it. And uh, as you do that, you turn this handle 20 to 30 times when it comes together, uh, you get a sample of it, you put it in here in a cup, you measure the wet weight of it. That's so how much water in the soil for it to behave liquid. You take that, put it in the oven and dry it up. You wind out how much water is evaporated, how much water is on the soil for it to behave liquid. You've got the dry weight and you've got the wet weight, you measure the water contents. Another test you do in the lab is called plastic limit test. You wanna know how much water you should add to the soil to behave semi-plastic. You roll it to one eighth of an inch, you get the wet weight of it, you put it in the oven and dry it up and you get the dry weight of it. And you wanna know how much water is in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. And if your PI, the liquid limit between the liquid, the, the difference between liquid limit and plastic limit is plasticity index. If the PI is less than 20, you got low swell potential. Between 20 and 30 is moderately expansive. Between 30 and 40, highly expansive. Above 40 is very highly expensive soils. A couple of other tests you do in the laboratory is called hand penetrometer and torrent test. In your hand penetrometer test, you take a soil sample, you push into it like this. You measure the strength here. In a tour vein, you put it at the end of the sample, you shear it in torsion, you read here what kind of strength it has. If you want to get fancier, you can go unconfined compression test. In this test, you put the sole sample in the machine and you start crushing it. This is the proving ring, this is a deflection. You crush the sample, you get the strength of the sample as you crush it. You use that bearing capacity for bearing capacity calculations. For your foundations, you know, for your spread footing, for your pile foundations, you want to know how much strength that soil has. You can also run triaxial testing for your slope stability analysis. If you have detention ponds or your slopes, you take a soil samples, you put it in a membrane, you put it in a cell like this, you subject to geostatic stress. That's the stress the soil was a subject to in the ground and start shearing it. That's what the soil sample looks like. And you fail. You develop stress strain curves and phi angle, the effective stress and total stress. For total stress, you got a shear strength of 1.5 psi, phi of 20 degrees. You got a cohesion of 1.4 and 29 for effective stress. Direct shear tests. It's hard to run triaxial tests on sand. So you do what's called direct shear test. In this test, you got a cup like this. This is the weight. You put the weight in here, geostatic load. You fill up your cup here with sand. You cover it up, put it in the cell. You shear it horizontally. You run the machine, it shears horizontally. And uh, this is the sand, you move it, the box, and you shear it. You develop stress strain curves. This is the residual strength after highest strains. This is the peak strength. This is the phi angle, over consolidated peak. So you get C phi angles there, gradation test. If you want to know what the gradation is in your sandy material, your gravel, on your project, you do a sieve analysis, you put in a sieve shaker and shake it. You develop this curve in here, show percent passing, like for a 200 sieve, you see how much clay you got, sand, clay and silt, you got only 
sitting on their percent passing, 18% passing. So majority of it is sitting on top, which is that means the material is mostly coarse aggregate. Hydrometer test. If you want to know how much sand and silt you've got, you do hydrometer analysis of a is basically is in dispersed water in a dispersed state. The soil particles will settle individually in water. That's a Stokey law. It's assumed that the, the soil particles are spheres and the velocity of the particles can be given by the Stokey law. You mix the soil in water and you put hydrometer in it. This is a regular water, what we call control. This is the hydrometer. From that, you can get the gradation of the soil below 200 mil, 200 size sieve. So you can see how much silt you got, how much clay you got. A couple other tests that you do in the field is a proctor test. In this test, you wanna know the compaction characteristics of the soil. This is the fill material, this is the natural soil. And you can see in here, uh, this is the natural soil, the gumbo soil out there. That's the fill material. And uh, select fill, the select fill, select structural fill has got a liquid limit of less than 40 PI between 10 and 20. That's a select fill. You go to a pit to get your select fill. This is like a sprint sand fill clay. If fill, pit's got different materials, it's got sandy materials, it's got clay material. So just because you got material from the fill, uh, from a pit, it's, it's not uniform. It's got different materials in it. You get a backhoe, you dig out the material and put it back to the truck. This is a sandy clay material. You load up the back of the truck. You take it to the, uh, you to put it in a hopper or so, and you can load it up on the top of the truck. You run the proctor test. You take a sample of soil, about 50 pounds, spread it out and dry it up. This is the natural soil. You add water to it, the different water contents, and you compact it in the mold. This is a four inch mold, six inches high, 5.5 pound hammer drop, 12 inches, 25 blows per lift, three left, three layers. You compact that soil in machine with the machine. You know the volume of it. You extrude it. You weigh it, you know the volume, you get the density curve. This is moisture density relationship. Optimal moisture content, maximum dry density. You wanna compact your soil to 95% in standard proctor density and moisture content plus and minus 2%. So 95% of 122 is about 115 at moisture contents between nine and 13%. You wanna compact your soil. As you compact that soil, you can see the strength of it too. As you will find out, the strength of the soil is the highest near the optimal. So you wanna compact your soil close to the optimal moisture so that you develop the maximum strength. Okay, California bearing ratio. So what I'm gonna do here, uh, I'm gonna take a five minute break here and we're gonna come back and go over with what the, CBR is. Let's take a five minute break.
All right, let's get going again. California bearing ratio. On a lot of your projects, uh, when you want to have haul roads or roads for your plants, you want to know what the pavement design should be like. So you run a test called California bearing ratio, which you got a 1.9 inch diameter piston in diameter. And you, you relate the, the stiffness of your soil to the crush stone, which is this California bearing ratio of 100. You soak the sample for four days under one PSI loading that basically models the load of the pavement. And you get the resilient modulus of 1500 type CBR for pavement design. But crushed limestone has got a load at penetration of 0.1 inch of 3000 pounds. Crushed stone has got 2, 0.2 inch, 4,500 pounds. And so we run a laboratory CBR, which is five point pound hammer, pound hammer drop 12 inches or 10 pound hammer drop 18 inches. Compact the soil in a mold like this. This is a six inch mold. You put it in the water to show what the soil does when it gets all saturated. And measure the heave or deflection. And you put the piston in it, start loading it up. This is one PSI load on top of it. And you measure the load at 0.1 inch deflection. You develop a curve that looks like this. At 0.1 inch, you have 142 pounds or CBR of 14.2 at 0.1 inch and 12.2 at 0.2. So use 12.2. That's your CBR. Use that for, for pavement design. You can do that in the field, which is more accurate. You get a truck and you jack up the truck. And then you put the beam in there and you got a proving ring and you got the piston to the ground. And then from that, you can get the field CBR. Consolidation test. This test, we want to know how much load we can put on the soil to estimate the settlement. So if you got a heavy tank foundation, you want to know how much that tank is going to settle at the center or the edge, you run consolidation test. You get a soil sample, you put it on, the, on this, basically a ring in here, you put it in this cell, you put load on it, and you measure deflection here. You measure deflection, you put the load equal to the load of the tank. Okay, or any kind of other structure. This is a load settlement characteristics. As you put more load on it, you develop, you got a small avoid ratio. Engineering analysis, soil types around Texas and Louisiana, got lots of clays. These are the gumbo clays, it's got clay site. You got sandy soils. This is a sand site, you go to Galveston. This is a sandy site. This is silt. The grain size of the silt is uh, bigger than clay, smaller than sand, really a hard material to build on. This is a silt in Midland, Odessa. If you do a plant project over there, you see all this silt where they get stuck in. And uh, you have gravel, you start going deep in some of the soils around Colorado River stuff, uh, areas, you're gonna get some of these gravel type material. So we got clay, you go deeper, you got orange clay. You know that, you got white clay. Then you get into weathered rock. You got like in Huntsville. This is actually Dallas, limestone. Fill, you can build on top of the fill. Fill is a heterogeneous material, consists of clays and sands. As long as it's free of organics and compact 95% of standard proctor density or modified proctor, you can build on top of it. So fill is a good material, it's heterogeneous. If you go around Houston to see what kind of soils we have, you start from where, you know, Roman forest where I am, you got basically sandy clays and then uh, clayey sand in here. You go to Kingwood, parts of Kingwood, you got highly expansive soils, gumbo, some of it is sandy. You go to Tascosita, you got sand over gumbo clay with trees really expansive and a lot of movements. You go to Channel View, Galena Park, Baytown, Mobile View, where Targa is. We got lots of gumbo clay out there at the Mobile View. 
Baytown, LaPorte, Seabrook, League City, Friendswood, Missouri City, Sugarland, New Territory, Rosenberg. You got highly expansive soils, all these areas in here. You start going to Cinco Ranch, the soils becomes low, low plasticity and um, sandy soils here. You go to Bridgeland, Fairfield, you got basically sandy soils over clay, uh, not expansive. Tomball, you got some areas got highly expansive soils, some areas very sandy soils. You go to the woodlands area, you got some areas mostly sandy clay or sandy soils, low PI soils, not very expansive. You go to West U, Bel Air, Tanglewood, you got highly expansive soils, big trees, and a lot of attorneys. These are expansive soils. During the dry time, you're going to develop these shrinkage cracks in these expansive soils. Then they get debris fall into them. As the debris fall into them, they, get, they fill up. And when it rains, they start swelling and they want to, you know, basically close these cracks. Then they start cracking at 45 degree angles called slick insides. These are slick insides. They are very slick. So if you're doing excavations for your piping or you're doing an excavation with detention pond, the whole side of the excavation is gonna collapse and so because of the presence of slick insides. So you go around Texas, these are the gumbo clays, the red stuff. Soils are Texas are variable. So everywhere you go, you gotta do a soil test. These are the soils that may expand to 1,500% U.S. Corps of Engineers. So we got lots of expansive soils around the U.S. Texas and Louisiana, expansive soils. In, in Texas, the cities like Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, uh, and Houston, they all are located in areas where we got a lot of expansive soils. Lubbock, Odessa, Midland. El Paso, they got sandy soils, caliche, stuff like that. So it's not as bad. North of Buffalo Bayou in Houston, you got sandy soils. South of Buffalo Bayou, you got gumbo clays. It's a boring log in here. Shows the soil top from zero to two feet. You got crushed limestone from two to about 13, 18 feet. You got fat clays, gumbo clays. Below that, you got lean clays. That's a low PI clay. Then you hit sand. Below that, you got fat clay. You hit the water just above the sand here at 20 feet. Then once you hit the sand, the hydrostatic pressure pushes it all up to two feet. Well, actual groundwater is about 20 feet deep. One of the things we do on the plant projects we plot the soils to data so that because the soils are so variable and heterogeneous, you want to develop trends. This is the boring elevation as a function of soil properties. This is the strength of the soil, the shrink strength. Here's the moisture content. Here's the total unit weight. The high moisture content, you got lower strength. Low moisture content, you got high strength. So if I want to put piers underneath this building here, I'll put them right here at elevation 10. Near elevation, you know, 30 and 20, you got soft soils. Here's the soil stratigraphy. These are the borings along the plant. You got zero to 18 feet, you got clay. Below that, you got sand. Below that, you got clay. One of the things you want to figure out is potential vertical rise. Potential vertical rise is expressed in terms of inches. We want to know how much a soil experiences heave at a specific location. How much movement you're going to have. How much potential vertical rise you're going to have. So if this is Houston, it's a map of a potential vertical rise I developed. You go to Mount Bellevue, you're going to have five, six inches of movement. Baytown, five, six inches. Laporte, five, six inches. Lake City, six, seven inches of movement. You go out there to Fres Fresno, five inches. 
sugar line four or five inches. You go out there into great wood, you got six inches of movement. You go out there to full share two to four inches. Okay, you go out there in Fairfield area about one and a half inches. You go out there in Woodlands, you're gonna have about one and a half inches. Tomball, one to four inches. PBR for pipe racks should be less than a half an inch. PBR for the building should be less than one inch. How to reduce the PBR? You can remove the expansive soils. You replace it with select structural fill. Okay, for example, if your site's got a PI of 60 and active zone of 10 feet, you got to remove seven foot of soil to get the PBR to one inch. Sometimes it's not economical to do that. If you want to have a PBR of two inch, you got to have to remove 48 inches of the soil. Replace it with select structural fill. In terms of foundations, we have deep foundations such as drill footing, piling, auger cast piles and helical piles that we use for plant work or conventional reinforcer slab, mats, spread footings. In terms of movements and risks, structural slab with pier is gonna have less, less, less amount of movement. Slab on fill with piers gonna have, you know, some movement, but less than, it's, you know, it's very safe, but structural slab is better. Floating slab supported on piers is a uh, slab cannot go down, but it can, it can go up. Floating super slab is a slab that doesn't require com compaction. It's sitting on top of the soil. The gray beams go into natural soil, about six inches thick, and the seven inches thick, and the gray beams go into the natural soils. And of course, the least expensive one would be a floating slab foundation, which would be a Conventional reinforced slab or post tension slab. For industrial building, we'll use a lot of piers or piling. These buildings, they got heavy loads on them. You may have overhead crane. These overhead cranes, they can't tolerate much deflection. So you're going to have to make sure you put them on piers so that they don't have much movement on them. Here's the overhead crane right there. These are overhead cranes. These are floor slab loading. You see all these steel rolls out there sitting on top of the floor. That's a lot of load out there. It's 3000 PSF loading right in here. It causes a lot of deflection. These loads, if the slab is transferring loads to the columns, this column's got to go in deep piers or piling. You can see floor slab loading here. Major floor slab loading. When you have a big floor slab, you need to put control joints in it to tell it where to crack. Usually go about 10, 15 foot apart and you put a control joint in. These are the control joints. It tells the crack, you do saw cut one fourth of the slab within eight to 12, 12 hours or so of this, uh, when your slab is poured. It tells the concrete where to crack. And here's your column. Otherwise, you're gonna get cracking in here around the column because the slab is gonna move separate from, uh, from the column. So you're gonna get cracking between the column and the, so you gotta put an isolation joints between the columns. And, uh, and the slab could be circular, it could be diamond. You put a joint in here. These are industrial slab. They got a lot of steel in them because of the heavy loads. Double mat steel. These are structural slab on piers, Texas a and project. Uh, you can see that it's a structural slab. You got a void underneath it. That's a structural slab system. See the void under the slab. 
This allows us expansive soils to move up and down. It's not gonna move up your slab. Sitting on piers. Here's another uh, industrial slab here. Sitting on a pre-stressed pre concrete, uh, pre-cast concrete panels. These are the grade beams. These are precast panels. This is a house. They didn't want any movement on it. So we'll put it on a structural slab on piers. It's a structural slab. These are the piers. But the piers were too shallow. So the slab starts moving. The whole house starts having cracks. These are trial pictures. A lot of slab. This is another house here on a structural slab. Shallow piers, 10 foot deep, on raised heights. You got interior beams, you got a crawl space. These crawl space beams are sitting on, not on expansive soil. They should be having void boxes underneath them. They don't have it. It's a crawl space since they didn't have all void boxes, so the slab started moving. Lots of movement. There's another house out there in Seabrook, highly expansive soils, crawl space. These are the piers. These are underpinning co columns, sitting on a spread footings. <clears throat> it's a crawl space foundation. Piers were eight feet deep. Piers were too shallow, so the whole thing started moving. The contractor puts these columns in there on a spread footings. They stabilize it for three months and after that start moving again. They're combining piers and this. It doesn't work like that. So the things start moving. So we told them to take all those out. Go support the whole thing on helical piles. Next item is a structural slab on void boxes. So you get a building like this, you got highly expansive soils. You put it on void boxes. Void boxes basically, uh, when they get wet, when they get wet, they create a void under the slab, and um, the expansive soils will move into it. And so, as it does that, it doesn't lift the slab up. So you have void boxes under your slab. You put void boxes. This is the grade beams as well as the floor slab areas. These are the void boxes. These are the grade beams. The food void boxes under the slab and in the, in, in the drill pier areas. Then you cover it with vapor barrier. Here's a two-way slab residential foundation. It doesn't require um, interior beams doesn't require compaction. You just go out there, remove the grass, you drill your piers, you put void boxes in if you need to, if the soils are expansive. If they're not, you don't have to. There's no void boxes. These are drop beams right in here. It's like a two-story you know, parking garage. This is your uh, post engine cables, mild steel, mild steel for temperature controlled post engine cables. You can put your plumbing in and pour your slab usually about six, seven inches. No grade beams, no compaction required. All the loads go into the piers. Two-way slab. Drill pier foundations. A lot of the pipe rack structures are going on drill piers. Also, if you got a port facility, you put a lot of these uh, wharf type structures, piers on, on piers. So your stacks like this, they go on piers or piling. So they can be supported on piers, heat exchanger, tanks. It can be supported on, on piers, water tanks, elevated water tanks, transmission towers, cell towers, 
A lot of the drill shaft designs are based on drill shaft design manual by U.S. Uh, National Highway, U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration. The way you put the piers in the ground, you got three methods to put piers in the ground. Dry method, casing method, and slurry method. You drill a hole in the ground to try to do dry method of construction. Drill a hole. You got an auger rig. You got a, uh, this is a reamer rig. You drill a hole with the auger. That's all auger rig is. You drill a hole with the auger. Then you put the reamer in there and start making the bell. You drill a hole, make sure you don't have more than three inches of water in it. Too much water is not good. You measure the depth, make sure you got the right depth on it. You check with the hand penetrometer, make sure you got proper strength. Check the strength values. If the strings are low, you're gonna to have to increase the size of your bell. This is your reamer open up. Make sure you got the right size bell. Make sure you check that. You put a belling tool in there to measure the bell size. Put the steel cage in there. Yeah, somebody's got a question. So do you have, okay, we're, we're gonna get to the uh, uh, helical piles in a minute. Let me just get into it in a minute. Um, so you put the cage in there, start pouring the concrete, make sure it doesn't hit the sides of the excavation. Pour the concrete. In a dry method of construction, you drill the hole, you put the cage in, you trim the concrete all the way from bottom up. Casing method of the construction. If you got caving problems and no water, you can use casing method of construction. You drill the hole, the pilot hole, you put the casing in there. You, cut, you basically go through the caving materials like sandy soils. You drill through it, you get to the design depth. You check with the hand penetrometer, make sure you've got the strong soils. If you don't, you have to enlarge your bell size. This is the reamer. You put the reamer in there and make the bell. Put the steel cage in there. Pour concrete, pull out the casing. You trim the concrete like a funnel from top to the bottom. Basically, concrete comes out in the bottom. Slurry method of construction. In this test, you drill a hole, fill it up with drilling mud. Drilling with mud is made out of bentonite and water. Keeps the hole open, it sticks to the sands, keep the sands from collapsing. Also, the hydrostatic pressure keeps the hole open. You got a mud pit. You put bet nine in it. You drill the hole, put the cage in. Bet nine sticks to the sands like a cake. Also, you got the hydrostatic pressure. It keeps the hole open. Start pumping the concrete from bottom up. As it comes up, it removes the uh, bentonite. You got a recyc recycling pit. It's your concrete. Slurry method of construction, you drill with the drilling mud. You put the cage in. You trim the concrete from bottom up. The unit weight of the concrete is heavier than drilling mud, so it re replaces the drilling mud. Drilling mud sticks to the sands and silts, keeps it from caving. A lot of the piers are going in with slurry method of construction. 
So you got to be very careful. Read the SOAR reports. A lot of SOAR reports specify a slurry method of construction. They'll go out there and bid the project with dry method of construction and then find out you got to use a slurry. Pier grade deep connection for buildings. This is your pier. You want to bring the steel all the way up into the grade beams. You don't bend it. That allows the grade beam to come off the piers if you've got expansive soils. You sleeve the, 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 the steel coming out of the piers. This is your grade beam. This is your piers, void boxes. The way you determine your pier depths, you got to be at the pier depth. You have to anchor the pier in anchor zone. And typically what we have is an area is a moisture active zone. Moisture active zone is a zone that we saw experience shrinking swell problems. It's when you hit sand layer, when you hit the rock layer, that's the active zone depth. When you hit a sand layer, you hit active zone depth. Two for the lowest root fibers. When the soil suction is less than 0.027 PF. When the liquidity index of the soil becomes vertical, depth of slick insides, depth of historical water table. So you have your moisture active zone, then you have a zero movement line. The soil above here move up and down, but the soil below it do not move up and down because of the surcharge load this area, you got all these surcharge loads, so it doesn't move up and down because of the zero movement line. Because of the surcharge, the soil does not move anymore. So you got the movement active zone, which is equal to the zero movement line. Then you have to anchor it below that to resist uplift. The piers do not resist uplift. So what you have here, you have to design for compressive loading. You got end bearing and skin friction to resist downward movement. This is the zero movement line. Then you got the zero movement line here. The soil above it will grab the pier and wants to push it up. You have to anchor it below it to, so that the soil does not move. Okay, this is basically do not account on the bell because by the time bell resists upward movement, your pier has moved up two to three inches. So you're going to get superstructure cracking. Imagine you have pipe racks and you got light pipe rack there. Uh, and it moves hat one inch up and that's going to mess up your pipe rack. So you don't want it to move up. So you don't count on the, on the bell to resist uplift. So if you got a soil, you got clay over sand. If your clay is zero to 10 feet, your active zone is 10 foot, PI of 40. Your pier has got to be at least 20, 25 foot deep to resist uplift expansive soils. Here are your piers, you got interior beams on your slab. Is a target out there in, in the heights, it's got foundation problems. It's basically a tilt wall panel type building. You got interior columns, so basically a slab on grade, no interior beams. It's a floating slab system. So if the ground moves, the slab moves. So in Houston area, your active zone is 10 foot. Your pier's got to be about 20 foot. Dallas, your active zone is 20 foot. Your pier's got to be, you know, at least 25, 30 foot, 40 foot deep. If you go to Las Colinas, it's got to be pretty deep. You go to San Antonio, you got active zone 30 feet deep in some areas. You're going to have to have piers 50, 50 feet or so, 60 foot deep. Austin, active zone at 20 feet, your pier is going to be at least 30, 35 foot deep. This is Houston Pearland. If you look at these sound walls in here, they're sitting on piers, but some areas, the piers are coming out of the ground. If the piers are too shallow, they come off the ground. Here's you may check the piers to see they're under, you know, under the structure. You drill right next to them. Make sure there's a pier there. This is your pier. This is your bell tip. And distance from here to here is the bell size. You measure that for 12, 36 inch piers. This distance should be about 12 inches. 
That's the tip of the pebble, and this is the shaft. This is a pier that's too shallow. There's a void in between the bottom of the pier and the soil. Soil has grabbed it and pulled it up. So there's a void there. There's a void underneath the pier. In the floor step areas, if you have expansive soils, you compact the soils, you, you, you basically do a structural slab with void or slab on fill to get the PVR to less than one inch. You do a chemical injection. Do non-expansive soils, you just compact the soil, you pour a slab on top of it. Helical piles. These helical piles, basically, there are steel helical piles, but they are protected against corrosion for 75 years. So they last for a long time. Basically, they're augers, you screw them into the ground. These are different, different shapes of the helical piles. You just screw them into the ground. This is just zoom, just put it in. Really good, sweet piece of a you know device. He doesn't care if you have water, casey, caving problems, slurry method, none of that stuff. They're very good, especially for renewable energy type stuff. Structures, uh, you can use silico piles of structures. Sometimes you drill a bigger hole and you put a helico pile in there to resist lateral loading, or you put them in batters. These are helical piles in here. You put steel on top of it. You pour a slab on top of it. They are very fast. You can put it in a couple of days. You can put a bunch of helical piles in the ground. You put them in a batter to assist a lateral load. So here is you get a skid mount on helical piles right there. The skids are sitting right on top of helical piles. Pipe racks supported on helical piles. Just screw them into the ground. Or if you have a grade beam, you put them in there. You put your void boxes in. You pull your slab. On the solar farms, you go out there and start drilling. You put your helical piles in there. Start connecting together. Put the structure together. Put the solar panels in and they all are sitting on helical piles. Pile foundations, the great foundation system, they carry heavy loads. A lot of the structures are supported on concrete or steel pipe type, pipe pile foundations. A lot of port facilities supported on pile foundations. You drive them in there with the Dell Mac hammer. These are pre-stressed concrete piles. They've got big surface area for skin friction and end bearing. You see you driving in there with the Dell Mac hammer. You do bridges with them. Again, you can see them battered to resist lateral loading. These are steel pipe piles. You open them, up, uh, you drive them open ended, develop a plug, which is equal to an end bearing. Drive them into the ground. You build them for port facility type stuff, structures, pier structures, timber piles. You get tre treated piles out there. They're usually 12 inch squares or they're round. You drive them into the ground like that. This is Seabrook. This is actually Brazoria County Park project. You pick up the pile, drive them in. You don't use the backhoe to drive them in. This is a hammer. You drive the square timber pile into the ground. This is the hammer. Big hammer there. You build houses with it. You don't crack them. Soil structure interaction. In a structure subject to lateral loading. Wave loading. 
offshore or basically wind farms are subject to lateral loads or vibration. You're going to design a lot of this stuff here based on the API method for axle capacity and lateral capacity using PY curves for lateral loading. Use LPILE software for lateral load analysis to develop load deflection curves. This is the basically the, the bottom of the structure in here sitting on a pile. You got TZ curve for load settlement, PY curves for deflections on lateral load and T theta curves for torsional movements. We develop all this for, for your foundation data. TZ curves uses load settlement. This is a loop movement of the tip point resistance. F over X, F max is shear strength on the side. And that's the movement of the pile. And you get them into small pieces and you can load them in and you can run the program. And uh, you get load deflection curve. You get a load settlement of the, the pile. This is the computed. This is the, what, what actual is. Negative skin friction on a lot of this plant work. Let's say you're in Louisiana, you're gonna add six foot of fill. You got soft soils. Those soils are gonna settle and you drop piling and there, it develops negative skin friction. When soft soils around the pile settles, it will cause downward movement soils against the pile skin friction called negative skin friction or down drag. You can use what's called beta method to calculate the down drag. It, for the down deck to occur, there should be at least one to two inches of settlement before it occurs. For negative skin friction to occur, you should have cohesive soils over cohesionless deposits and you drop piles through it and uh, you load it up, put fill on it, plus fill over compressible cohesive soil deposit, lowering the groundwater with resulting ground subsidence. For negative skin friction to occur, a portion of the pile must be fixed, like cohesive soils over sand. It should be fixed against vertical movement. If the entire pile moves down with the cons consolidated, with consolidation, no negative skin friction will develop. You can use beta method to calculate the down drag. It's basically uh, skin friction is equal to beta times you know, basically uh, the geostatic stress in here, the, uh, the beta for clays is 0.2 to 0.25, for silts is 0.25 to 0.35, for sands 0.25 to 0.5. P is the pile diameter, H is the layer thickness, F is S, negative skin friction. So basically, F sub S is equal to beta times the geostatic stresses, which is the gamma H. And so also group effects. Typically you don't put piles closer than three diameters to each other. Otherwise you have to go, go for reduction. If your piles are two and a half, you have about 65%, 70% reduction on strength. Okay, so that's the curve that you can use to estimate group effects. But your, your efficiency of a factor is 1.0 when your piles are three diameters apart. Pile driving, you drive the piles into the ground with a steam hammer or diesel hammer. You can put them in batter or you can drive them in vertical. Use the textile specs 404 for your pile driving. Refusal is about 120 blows per foot. And these guys are driving some piles on the ground. <laughs> Doesn't have much capacity that pile. If you can't drive the pile to the design depth, you would drive. You can do pilot hole, which is a, a hole, which is four inches less than the diagonal of a square pile, one inch less than diameter of a round pile. 
or you can do jetting, which is 2.5 inches of pipe, 150 PSI pressure, drive the pile a minimum of one foot below the tip elevation or 100 blows per foot. You can use hammer formulas to calculate dynamic pile capacity, which depends on the hammer type, gram weight, stroke blow counts to drive the pile. Not very accurate, but if you want to know the dynamic capacity, you can use hammer formula. To determine what size hammer to use in your project, if you are in a timber pile, you use something hammer energy of 330R. R is the design load. So your design load is 20 tons. So that would be 6,600 foot pounds. I got a question here. What does a micro pile into the portfolio? Yeah, micro pile, we use that a lot for underpinning or uh, it's not a regular pile. We don't drive it with a hammer or anything. Uh, and so you basically grout it in place. You drill a hole, you put it in there. Um, it's called micro pile. You do a grout deal with it. It's not like a regular pile. I have a presentation on micropile on foundation repair techniques that you can go listen to and, and uh, talks about micropiles. If you got a concrete piles, 250R, R is the design load. So if you got a hundred tons pile, that's 225,000 foot pounds that you got to use for your hammer. Pile freeze, when you drive a pile in clay, with time, it gains the strength. It's called pile freeze. So when you drive a pile, you've got a dynamic capacity for clay is usually twice. So if your design is 50 tons, when it sits down and it freezes, you may get 100 ton capacity out of that pile. Essentially, pile, when you drive it with time, it gains the strength. It loses basically the pore pressure, dissipates, and it does that, it increases your effective stress, it grabs your pile, with time, it increases the strength, you know, pore pressure dissipates, so you get a pile freeze. Pile relaxation, if you drive piles in very dense sands, in organic silts or fissured clays, your actual pile dynamic capacity is gonna be less than, more than your static capacity. So you gotta do a pile load test to actually check that to see if you're gonna get what we call pile relaxation. Uh, uh, that you don't, we don't see that very often in Houston area, but I see a lot of it out there. If you, know, if you go to Saudi Arabia or something like that, you may have some of that stuff. Pile heave, you drop one pile, the other piles pop out of the ground. You've got upward movement or re rebound of piles after driving you know, called pile heave. In Houston Ship Channel Toll Bridge, the, you know, the, 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 the old one, it was sitting you know, in 1978, 250 piles for each bent. Uh, there were two of them in there. And uh, these piles, you drive one, and another one put up, you know, come out of the ground. But they all would carry loads. Run a static load test, and they all would carry the load. But as you drive the pile in the ground, it got soft clays, push the soil up, and pulls, push this other piles around it. It's called pile heave. By a dynamic load test, if you want to know the guy contractors going out there start driving piles and says, hey, man, I can't drive these piles anymore. I'm not at the design tip, but I cannot drive it. So you can do dynamic tests out there on the pile. You can do pile driving monitoring, measures of pile stress, pile integrity, hammer performance, capacity at the time of testing, which is dynamic pile capacity. You put an accelerometer and a strain gauge on the pile. You drive it in the ground. That's the PDA, pile driving analyzer. That's the accelerometers. This is strain curve, strain gauge. You put one on each side of the pile. You drive them into the ground. You measure the dynamic capacity. Pile. This is for a bridge, abutment one. Shaft resistance was 365 kips. Total resistance was 120 to 100. The total was 494 kips. The design was 200 kips, so it met capacity. So the design was fine. So we cut the top of the piles and poured the bridge. You can also do static load tests. 
If this is your pile in here, you put the frame around it, you start loading up your pile, you measure the deflections, you measure the load and deflection, and you draw load settlement characteristics of the pile. This is a load settlement. This is the movement. This is the load. This is for pile quick load test, Texas quick load test, which you drive basically do tangent to this, tangent to that, to measure the actual ultimate capacity. For piling, you draw a tangent to this where you get about 0.5 inch per ton. For drill periods, you drive a tangent where you get 0 0.01 inch per ton. And this is the design, these are the factor of safety of two to come up with your design load. You can use the design load evaluation by TxDOT, double tangent method or plunging failure method. It's got a factor of safety of 2.3 for this. Auger cast piles. Uh, looks like we got a question in here. Yeah, we talked about the micro piles. If I'm doing a project, you know, if I've mm -hmm. got a tight spot or something like mm -hmm. that, uh, I'm doing a renovation or something, I can use micro piles, but I wouldn't use micro piles for new construction. Auger cast piles, these are augers. You drive them into the ground, basically drill into the ground. You drill them into the ground. The spoils will come up. This is the basically the medical center on I-10 and Gessner. You can see you drive them in, you drill them into the ground, the, the spoils come out. There's a hole in here. You put the grout coming through the grout hole. This is the auger. When you drill it, you go to the bottom. Then after you drill it, you, you put the grout in it. You basically you take the cage and push it down in there. You push it into the grout. Or you put a regular bar in there, a number, number eight bar to resist, you know, uplift loading. Spread footings. A lot of the petrochemical projects are sitting on spread footings. These are horizontal tanks or vertical tanks. It could be sitting on spread footings. You dig a hole. You put your steel in it. Pour the spread footing. And then you put the load on top of it. These are spread footings. Slab on grade. Well, little metal building out there on your plant site. You can put a slab, four inch, five inch concrete slab on great beams. You go out there and dig your beams out there. You put a waffle slab. You don't put roll wire mesh in there. You pour concrete, make sure you use chairs, not acceptable. You spread the concrete. Again, you have to have chairs, otherwise the seal is in the bottom. This is not acceptable. They're pouring concrete on top of vapor barrier. It's not acceptable. That still ends up in the bottom. You pour the concrete, you finish it up. Here's the concrete. Again, you're gonna have to have chairs underneath them. When you pour that concrete, you got a saw cut within four to 12 hours. If you got a big slab, tell the concrete where to crack. It's a control joint, tells it where to crack. On heavy structures, you use mat foundation. You can use a mat, you dig a hole in the ground, put your steel in for a mat. Pour concrete. You go downtown, for example, a lot of the structures are mat. You got a parking garage. It's called partially compensated foundation. Because of the heavy load, you take some of the soils out so that this, the mat here does not feel as much load on it. You put soldier piles around it. You pour the concrete. And so that's a mat foundation. This is part one of the part, two part presentation here. So we're finished with the part one of the presentation. Uh, if you got pictures on projects, please send them to me. I really can use pictures. 
program evaluation. Please look at this program, see what you think of it. Uh, please tell me, uh, you know, if you have any comments or questions, uh, how'd you like it? And uh, let's see. I'm gonna do a poll in here and please respond to the poll. Uh, tell us what you think of the program. If you need to reach me, you can go David Eastwood, DE at geoteching.com or 713-699-4000. I've got a program coming up for AIA next week on geotechnical consideration with design of parking lots. If you wanna go there, send me an email. And then April 1st, design and construction forensic evaluation of residential foundations for National uh, Foundation Repair Contractors Association. And then on April 7th, part two of this program, design and construction of petrochemical and renewable energy. So if you wanna be on our email list, please send me your email information. You're gonna get your PDH hours next couple of days. Questions, anybody's got any questions? Can you share the PowerPoints? Yes, if you send me an email, we'll send you the PowerPoints. Any other questions? Okay, well, that concludes our program here. I appreciate your time. And uh, if you have questions or anything, please get back with me later. And uh, thank you very much. You all have a great day.